Hey, everybody. How you doing? It's Jamie from Divine Mommy and Soul to Sisterhood here. I am really grateful, really grateful to be here, really grateful to be here with you. This is my fourth podcast. Uh, my third podcast was done well over a year and a half ago, and um, I'm really so filled with gratitude uh, that I get to share this story with all of you now. So what's the story I'm going to be sharing? I've had a past life experience that I feel like is worthy of speaking into the ceremonial space to sharing it. And before I get too much further, I want to thank the sisters that have already listened to different facets of what it was that I experienced. You've helped me maintain my connection to how real this, this has been. Instead of it being like a dream and the first day it feels really uh, profound and deep. And then day by day, it gets just a little bit more diffuse to the point where we can get, I would say, kind of caught up in the belief system of, well, maybe that did, maybe that didn't really happen. But for me, my sisters have listened to me talk about this experience, this past life experience of meeting a former, I would say, a former version of myself, but when we met, the timeline converged. So it's a concurrent version of myself named Thomas. Um, and this meeting was inspired uh, by a trip to the exhibit showcasing the Book of Kells, and that is at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, and that's where I was a few weeks ago. So that's going to be our past life story that I get to tell. We're going to be talking about musical theater, and we're also going to be talking about magic. I got to share this William Butler Yates quote that I saw hanging on a banner from a light post as we were leaving Dublin just about 36 hours after this happened. And it just, it was so, it was such a visceral experience. The breath caught in my throat. The quote says, the world is full of magic things, patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. I'm going to grab my drum, Georgia. I'm going to drum a little bit. What magic things are in your environment, in your heart, in your consciousness? What magic things are there waiting to be spoken, waiting to be seen and waiting to be heard? Now, you've got to think this quote offers us so much generosity because these magic things are patiently waiting. They're not waiting and watching the clock. They're not waiting with only a few chances. They are just patiently waiting for us, patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. Oh, sisters, listen to the drum. What right now is waiting for you? Is it more love? Is it more light? It is, a, is it an up-leveling of your relationships? Is it a release of old paradigms and belief systems that don't work? What's patiently waiting for your senses to grow sharper? Maybe it's self-love and self-care. Maybe it's a new level of compassion for yourself in different roles of your life. Whatever it is. Let's just gift ourselves permission to experience an experience together today. You know, talking about past lives, some of you may not really buy into this concept. It may not be a fit for you. And that is a-okay. We don't have to have spiritual symmetry for us to give ourselves permission to connect so transformation can be invited into the sacred space. I mean, think about it. Sometimes our biggest opportunities for healing and transformation and expansion come in those situations where maybe we don't agree with someone or something, or it doesn't feel like a completely aligned fit. So again, gratitude for you, gratitude for you being here. Let's start out with musical theater. Okay, there's a song that has been one of my favorites for decades. It's called Meadowlark. Like I um, I think I said before, if I haven't said it already, Meadowlark is from a Stephen Schwartz musical entitled The Baker's Wife. Um, Patti Lapone played this role. It never made it to Broadway. It had a short run on the West End in London. However, this song is so um, ripe with transformational opportunities and invitations for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the lyrics, kind of like um, almost 
approaching it as a work of poetry. And then what we're going to do as I tell the story of Thomas, my past life concurrent self, we're going to weave in the different aspects of this song for transformation, um, kind of blending the, the potential for the metaphor to reflect the truth of our lives and the truth of our lives to support the metaphor so that that can offer us this safe, sacred container for transformation, alchemization, if you will. The lyrics go, when I was a girl, I had a favorite story of the meadowlark who lived where the rivers wind. Her voice could match the angels in its glory, but she was blind. The lark was blind. An old king came and took her to his palace, where the walls were burnished bronze and golden braid. And he fed her fruits and nuts from an ivory chalice, and he prayed, Sing for me, my meadowlark. Sing for me of the silver morning. Set me free, my meadowlark. And I'll buy you a priceless jewel and cloth of brocade and cruel. And I'll love you for life if you will sing for me. Then one day as the lark sang by the water, the god of the sun heard her in his flight and her singing moved him so that he came and brought her the gift of sight. He gave her sight and she opened her eyes to the shimmer and the splendor of this beautiful young god so proud and strong. And he called to the lark in a voice both rough and tender, come along. Fly with me, my meadowlark. Fly with me on the silver morning, past the sea where the dolphins bark. We will dance on the coral beaches, make a feast of the plums and peaches. Just as far as your vision reaches, fly with me. But the meadowlark said no, for the old king loved her so. She couldn't bear to wound his pride. So the sun god flew away. And when the king came down that day, he found his meadowlark had died. Every time I heard that part, I cried. And what, and sorry, and now I stand here starry eyed and stormy. Oh, just when I thought my heart was finally numb. A beautiful young man appears before me singing, come, oh, won't you come? And what can I do if finally for the first time? The one I'm burning for returns the glow. If love has come at last, it's picked the worst time. Still I know, I've got to go. Fly away, meadowlark. Fly away in the silver morning. If I stay, I'll grow to curse the dark. So it's off where the days won't find me. I know I leave wounds behind me, but I won't let tomorrow find me back this way. Before my past once again can blind me, fly away. And we won't wait to say goodbye, my beautiful young man and I. Ah. <sighs> What a beautiful song. The world is patiently waiting. The world is full of magic, <laughs> magic things, patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. Well, here's a way for our senses to grow sharper. Let's just take into consideration that we are the young girl telling the story, the young girl receiving the story. We're the meadowlark. We're the old king. We're the woman telling the story. We're the sun god or the beautiful young man, or the relationship, and we're the decision to finally fly. We are all of those things for ourselves. So let's let the magic of musical theater kind of be almost the conduit or the current for the rest of the story. I want to tell you about Thomas. So <clears throat> The Book of Kells. I had no idea what the Book of Kells was, but I need to go back and tell you a little bit about how everything came together in a beautiful way of divine convergence to make this happen. So I was on this trip with my husband and my daughter going throughout England to visit my husband's family and into Ireland where my husband grew up 
to see old places, you know, that were nostalgic for him to reacquaint ourselves with new places in Ireland, and also for him to get together with many friends of his and their families. So in England, I had a day set aside to go to the Glastonbury Goddess Festival. This is a week-long goddess festival that thankfully is happening in person again after our COVID experience. And I was only able to go for a few days or a few hours on the Friday of that week because of other family commitments. So my husband drove me down there with my niece and my daughter. I left them on the high street, hopped out of the car, went into the assembly hall where the goddess conference was converging. And I knew that I was having this beautiful, lucky experience where my friend, mentor, sister goddess, Annabelle de Bole, who I'd gotten friendly with in 2018 when I was there and have stayed connected to, I knew I was going to be able to get the experience of her workshop. It was happening on Friday afternoon, right? No coincidence is everything in divine alignment. So when I participated in Annabelle's just, oh, deeply transformative healing workshop, the focus of her workshop was on the goddess Danu or Don, which correlates to the Irish goddess Anu. They're the same consciousness stream. So after her workshop, of course, I couldn't wait to give her a hug and tell her how much she meant to me, told her we were heading to Ireland. And she said, oh, Jamie, you need to hike the paps of Anu. Well, at that time, she could have said, you need to hike the gobbledygooks. And I would have said, okay, like the paps of Anu, those words were arbitrary. I had no idea what that meant. So on the way home from Glastonbury, of course, I'm Googling everything. And I find out that the paps of Anu are in Ireland and they are a dedication. They represent through her body, Mother Earth's body, Gaia's body, our body, connecting us to the great mother goddess Anu, who is also known as Danu and Don, or I would consider back through that Mary Magdalene, Isis, Sophia lineage, all the way to the great mother creatrix. The paps are her breasts. And they are two mountain peaks side by side. And on top of each mountain peak is a beautiful barrier, burial cairn that they're guessing is between two and two and three thousand years old. So everything worked out for me to be able to hike the paps. Last minute, found an independent guide. My new best friend, Morris, who I just love, he and his daughter, Maddie, um, have an individual hiking company, or I should say a hiking company where they take people on tours, individual tours, group tours, bicycling tours all throughout Ireland. Um, I will make sure and put their information in the um, comments section so everyone can, can locate them if they want to access Morris and Maddie's beautiful hikes. So it just worked out. Morris took me on this wonderful hike up the Paps and something so wonderfully healing happened on this five hour hike. It was coming off of the energies. We just had Luna um, Lamas and Lunasa or Lunasad, which is the high ho cross quarter holiday between summer solstice and fall equinox. We just had that a few days before. And my interpretation of this, yes, it's about bringing in the grain and honoring the sun God um, and that sort of sacrifice to the fires of this new beginning of us turning into fall and harvest time. For me, when I'm working with those energies of uh, Lunasad or Lamas, um, it's about that sacred union of the masculine and the feminine coming together to create the dynamic of the divine masculine and the divine feminine birthing forth the divine child of whatever is next on my path of my spiritual ascension. And this hike was definitely part of that path. So what happened on this hike? Something transpired, which I'm not exactly sure what, and maybe I'm not meant to know exactly what it was, but something transpired. And Morris and I both felt it where we felt so safe and cherished and held within the bosom of the great mother goddess that we let our guard down. And it was an amazing step by step reminder of how loved and beloved we are, um, of how protected and important and valued we are. And this great mother goddess vibration, frequency, energy, whatever you want to call it, just held us to her breast and let us receive that healing mother's milk of sanctuary. 
And to let my guard down in that way of just being so present in the moment, so grateful, experiencing this with my friend Morris and him being aware of it and us both being able to talk about it. It shifted something so deep in me that I think set the stage for me to be able to be ready for this past life experience to come through days later. So thank you for listening up to this point. I want to talk about the past life experience now in specificity. So the Book of Kells, I've already told you, I really didn't know what the Book of Kells was. I knew it was important. My brother-in-law had talked to me about it quite a bit, saying it was just a beautiful exhibit worthy of our time and effort to go see it. So what did I do? I bought a ticket for myself and my daughter and my husband to go see it. And we get in there. And I realize after reading the first sort of placard, next to this beautifully blown up image from the book of Kells, that this is sort of a handbook of the four gospels. It's not a handbook. It's actually a very large book. This is a book of the four gospels, um, highlighting the new Testament gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it's housed, like I said, at Trinity college, it's said to have been created by monks around the year 800 AD. And when you read about the book of Kells, you read people talking about how transformative the experience is of seeing it. Many people say that it's clear it's the work of angels, not the work of mere man or humans. Um, people say words like the most delicate, intricate, detailed art this celtic design work is a design work of divine majesty and it's this beautiful artwork that houses all of this wonderful divine imagery and it's got yes the gospels of matthew mark luke and john from the new testament so the book of kells like i said it's a big book but still y'all it's like the size of a coffee table book it doesn't make much of an exhibit so the first like hour you spend in this big exhibit room where they have images from the book of kells blown up and of course next to it are sort of the explanations so I'm walking around with my daughter and reading the explanations to her. And my husband's kind of off on his own, you know, reading a little faster than we are. And I'm telling you, like step by step, the further I got into that exhibit room, I started having pretty specific symptoms. I felt sick, like I was going to vomit. I had tears in my eyes. I was choking them back, this huge lump in my throat. And I was filled with just oh my gosh, so much rage. And, you know, those things come on us and we think, what is going on? You know, I'm trying to hold it together. I'm trying to like read this for my daughter. I'm trying to make sense of it and have this conversation with her. Of course, it's packed in there. And I'm like having to stop myself from like wanting to push people out of the way and just get out of there. And the other thing I wanted to do was to start to scream. I wanted to like take my clothes off and in my nakedness say, don't you see what is missing? because the goddess is everywhere. She's everywhere. It's making me feel that lump in my throat again now. She's everywhere in all of that imagery. The beautiful Auriboros, the snake eating its tail, the peacock feathers, the wonderful intricate designs of just this beautiful feminine, divinity. And I was so struck by how upset I was. Now, those of you that know me, you know that I I really make studying history my business. So I've got that sort of working logical framework that, hey, I know this is just a mere what 475 years after the Nicene Creed, when Emperor Constantine decided to homogenize and prophetize Christianity. Christianity, and in doing that, took out the Gospels of Mary Magdalene, Philip, and Thomas, which hold a lot of what we consider, they're not the same as the Gnostic texts, but a lot of those same um, 
and similar sort of philosophies and teachings of the Gnostic texts of a mother and a father God, the divine feminine and the divine masculine, how Mary Magdalene was Jesus equal partner, beloved, sacred union, bringer forther of her lack of a better term. You can tell I'm getting <laughs> really emotional about this and excited too. So I know this, right? And I know this, this is part of my work. And I, I didn't know what I was walking into, but like, I've got the logic, I've got this sort of grounded rationale to be able to say like, it was just the time. I know how brutal that sort of cauterization of the feminine and that feminine energy, the death to the feminine was in those times, it had to be in those times to extricate the goddess from our consciousness. And they did a really, really great job However, they weren't obviously completely successful because here we are all here now. However, I know all this and yet still I was having this crazy visceral reaction. Okay, we get out of the Book of Kells exhibit. You funnel right into the, the great hall of the old library. Every, you know, insult was added to Andrew when I'm looking at all of these sort of um, exhibits too about women not being allowed in Trinity College and then having to write all these letters to the board uh, you know, about why women should be let in. Even Oscar Wilde's mom, I think, is a sign. Uh, she's one of the signatures signed on one of them. And I mean, I was like, I could not get out of there fast enough. I was done. All of the busts along the side are all men. I was like, get me out of here. Then you got to go through the gift shop. And my husband said, hey, let's get you a Book of Kells t-shirt. I was like, hell no, this is not my bag. Get me out of here. So we get out and we're sitting on the great lawn in between where the exhibit is in the student center. And I start hitting my chest, like activating with my hand, just activating my chest because my heart is breaking. And I look at my husband and I look at my daughter and as tears stream down my face, I realize, and I say to them, I just had a big past life experience come forward. And just saying that, gave me a foundation, a sense of understanding, a sense of awareness, a sense of acceptance that what I had experienced was real. And I didn't have all the keys to unlock the specificities and the nuance and the story and the narrative and all of that stuff, but I did have a foundation. I did have a starting place. My magic was patiently waiting for my senses to grow sharp. Sing the first verse of Metal Art. When I was a girl, I had a favorite story of the Metal Art who lived where the rivers walk. Her voice could match the angels in its glory, but she was blind. The Lark was blind. So think about it. When you were a girl, you had a favorite story that tethered you to your magic, that reminded you that, yes, you were in this physical world, but you were anything but a physical being. You were so much more, right? When we could hear the fairies and listen to the angels, feel the hugs from the trees, hear the songs of the flowers, right? And as we grow up, our meadow lark loses that sense of self. I was a girl, I had a favorite story of a meadowlark who lives where the rivers wind. Her voice could match the angels in its glory, but she was blind. The lark was blind. Sisters, sometimes we have to accept the blinders of blindness to survive. And what Thomas taught me, and I'm going to talk more about this, is that we can take those blinders off. We can create our own sanctuary and our own safety. So, what started to happen? This past life experience was more than just that awareness happening in the exhibit. I started to come down with really specific physical symptoms. The first thing that started was my chest became on fire. Taking a deep breath was almost impossible. I know from my esoteric healing background that any heart chakra issue dealing with the lower lungs is unexpressed grief. So I start shaking. I am freezing. So under the covers, I start doing my healing work on myself, calling in my guides. And <clears throat> I start to get a sense that this past life version of me was male, 
was a younger sort of in between probably late teens and late twenties age. And what happened to them was something that was very brutal, very torturous. The next day I woke up, I felt okay. My chest still really hurt, but by the afternoon, my body was just on fire. My joints felt like I'd been being pulled apart, like I'd been being drawn and quartered. My spine felt like it was being pulled apart, vertebrae by vertebrae. I was freezing. Oh my gosh. I laid down again under the covers and more messages started to come through. More messages started to come through. I started to be given the sort of sense that this has been gifted to me to transform through the multidimensional timeline. And that's kind of like, I don't know, an oxymoron because multidimensionally there is no timeline, but bringing what had happened then into the now moment so that it could be transformed and released. We flew home the next day. So I had eight plus hours to just sit quietly and continue working with this consciousness stream of Thomas. And by this time, I, I really hadn't known Thomas's name yet. But what I was given as sort of keys, each time I got quieter and I listened, I was given these keys that this person had been somehow given to the monastery at a, 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 one of those kind of ages where he couldn't have lived on his own. And he also uh, uh, was going to be used like as an apprentice or something, a role like that. I also was given the information that this past life version of me was raised by a medicine woman grandmother who raised him to be aware of the goddess within, who raised him to be so just comfortable with the divine masculine and the divine feminine. So we get home to Florida, where I'm from. The next day, the pain is still really intense, and I get in a hot bath. And this hot bath sort of offered me the opportunity to just sit and relax and go deeper into that innerverse landscape. And when I went deep, I was shown that I had to release the flesh from my bones, right? I mean, our higher selves, come on. <laughs> Thank goodness they're so uh, dramatic because that's such a fit with me, obviously, as you can tell. Um, but I had to release the flesh from my bones. I had to release that egoic sort of prison, the blindness. And I had to step in to fully accepting what was happening to me. I'm going to sing the second verse of Meadowlark. <clears throat> An old king came and took her to his palace where the walls were burnished bronze and golden gray. And he fed her fruit and nuts from an ivory chalice. And he prayed, sing for me, my metal lark, sing for me. that old king come in with the promises that we believe of being loved for life, of being gifted a priceless jewel, of being able to live in a palace, right? Maybe the palace is a complete fallacy, but a palace of walls with burnished bronze and golden braid. How many of us have chosen to fit into a box, to dim our light, so that we are accepted under the guise of this promise, the fallacy of the promise that will be loved forever, right? How many times have we done that to ourselves by choosing relationships that don't necessarily honor all of our being? How many times have we done that to ourselves with professional endeavors that maybe we self-sabotage before we even bring in that vibration of believing that we can be successful? I could go on and on about this, but how this relates to my experience with Thomas is I could have accepted the old king's promise to dim my light for the hope of 
unconditional love. And I could have stayed silent. I could have not sharpened my senses to the magic around me. And I could have pretended like it didn't happen because maybe just maybe I won't be accepted if I share my truth. It's something to think about. And as I laid in that bath and let my flesh fall from my bones, I went to Thomas as a skeleton, a skeleton version of myself, pared down to the very nitty gritty of who this human being that Jamie is. And when I went to Thomas as my skeleton self, I was presented another key. That's when he told me his name. That's when I was also given kind of specifics about Thomas's death and how he left his earth plane. He wouldn't stop asking questions. He was given to the monastery that's given credit for creating the Book of Kells. And as this young apprentice, he would not be silent. He kept saying, I see the goddess. I see her right there. Why is no one talking about her? Why are we not sharing her beautiful wisdom, her spirituality? Why are we not sharing her divine light? Why are we not including the equal divine feminine, divine masculine potential within each individual's being? Why are we not including this sense of divine sovereignty that the divine lives within? What the goddess teaches us is that we are all source. We are all one. Why are we creating this book in the most painstakingly artistic of ways to only tell one facet of the story? And Thomas was warned time and time again. And finally, his last warning came and he still would not be silent. And what happened was he was taken and he was tortured. Was he drawn and quartered? Maybe that's what I was feeling, but I know he was tortured and he was left to die in the cold, frigid environment, which is why I was feeling the feelings that I was feeling. His heart was broken, which is why my lower lungs were constricting. Uh, his body had been pulled in every which way, joints, um, had been pulled apart, muscles had been ripped, tendons had been severed. That's what I was feeling in my body. And the freezing sort of nature of me not being able to get warm was him being left to die in this frigid environment and ultimately freezing to death in this pain. Now you may say, Jamie, did you Google this? Can you find out, does Thomas really exist? And I thought of that and it was quickly followed by that quote, until the lion learns to write, the story will always be told by the hunter. I knew that if I found something in this linear physical dimensional way to validate Thomas back to me, I would not be stepping into the authenticity of Thomas's true story. I would be reading somebody else's perspective on it. And I didn't need that to validate what I know was happening inside of me, what I knew was real. So here's the thing Thomas said to me, all of the work you've been doing now has led to this moment. You have accepted your sacred contract these node points right through throughout the multiverse, throughout the Merkaba or Merkaba, however you choose to say it, have converged. And we are in a zero point place here where there is no time, there is no distance, there is no difference. And you are here with me as my spirit guide as I live through the death. And I am here with you as your spirit guide as you live through a death. Time ceased to exist. And we became one in that space. And I was able to hold Thomas through what he was going through. And through the most brutal of experiences, his higher self was able to communicate to me that it was our job to find a way to forgive those who are doing this to him and to also find love and gratitude for this experience because it made him who he was. And then he turned to me and he said, now it's your turn, Jamie. You get to forgive all of your captors. You get to forgive all the suffering and the torture. You get to have gratitude and love for everything that you've experienced because it's made you who you are. Now you may be saying, Jamie, suffering, torture. I'm not 
saying it's happened on the external. Yeah, life is never easy for anybody. That's why it's called earth school. And my earth walk has been my own earth walk. But sisters, just like you, my captors live within me. They are my belief systems, my limiting belief systems and laws and rules that I unconsciously live by that keep me in a box, that keep me severed from my light, that keep me looking to siphon off love from the old king, the promise of unconditional love, instead of standing in the pillar of unconditional love that I know I am. My captors are perfectionism, perceptions of what other people might think or feel about me, productivity, equaling my worth. Those are my captors. How do I step in and release those through forgiveness and gratitude, finding love and thankfulness for everything I've experienced up until now so that I have a rebirth moment? Because I'm not only rebirthing myself, I'm rebirthing Thomas as well. We are rebirthing ourselves together into a new version of this beautiful unification. So I ask you, sisters, this is a lot of magic. My senses got sharper. What is waiting for you to sharpen your senses? Put your hand on your body. Get your hands on your womb, on your yoni, on your heart, on your throat, on your ajna, and ask, ask this natural wisdom that our bodies possess. What do I need to know right here, right now? What is waiting for me? How do I release these captors that have kept me small, kept me believing that the old king is going to give me the palace and I'm still waiting, right? I'm going to sing the next verse of Meadowlark. Let's see what comes up from that. Then one day as the lark sank by the water, the god of the sun heard her in his flight and her singing him so that he came and brought her the gift of sight he gave her sight and she opened her eyes to the shimmer and the splendor of this beautiful young god so proud and strong and he called to the lark in a voice both rough and tender come along fly belief system is looking to be let go, right? So that we can dance on the coral beaches together. What ways are we limiting ourselves? How are we being our own torturers and captors and staying rooted in the vibration of suffering? How can we let that go so we can make a feast of the plums and peaches just as far as our vision reaches, right? We are our own sun god. This is our own higher self saying, I am patiently waiting. You have infinite chances. I am never going to give up on you. You are so worthy of this. Let's sing the next verse. But the meadow lark said no, for the old king loved her so. She couldn't bear to wound his pride. So the sun god flew away. When the king came down that day, he found his meadow lark had died. Every time I heard that part, I cried. We're going to say no. We're going to. It's OK. It's earth school. We get a chance to take the test again. We're going to say no. We're going to say no to our inner sun god. And we're going to die and we're going to be reborn. 
just like Thomas, we're going to die. We're going to be reborn, just like me. I'm going to let my perfectionism die. And guess what? A new version of me is going to be reborn again so that I get to deal with my perfectionism as a new me. The spiral is real. Every day we grow, right? Every day we are, we are growing. We are given this opportunity to ascend and evolve. Okay. Are we ready to keep releasing? Are we ready to keep releasing? Releasing our captors with love and light and gratitude because we now get to step into the adult version of us that gets to sing our next invitation. All right, ready? And now I stand here starry-eyed and stormy. Oh, just when I thought my heart was finally numb, a beautiful starry-eyed and stormy <laughs> oh my gosh as much as we grow we are still human beings having a spiritual experience and spiritual beings having a human experience <sighs> we're going to be given so many chances at this thing called life through our earth walk and damn it i am really glad that none of us have it perfectly figured out yet i say this in my groups all the time you know why because we're here we're here together and i would be pretty freaking lonely <laughs> without you oh just when i thought my heart was finally numb yeah who's thought this before finally forget about it i'm giving up closing my heart i'm done with this oh how many times have we sought that perceived solitude of putting on the blinders. Oh, it never works. It can't. We are too dynamic. We're too beautiful. We are too part of this natural world that's always growing, evolving, and dying and rebirthing itself. Sisters, that's us, the incarnate woman, the incarnate female with our bleeding and our birthing human children and idea children alike with our blood magic. And even if we're not actively cycling, we have the moon sisterhood, blood memory within our cells, within our bones. A beautiful young man appears before me. That's the magic patiently waiting, saying, hey, I'm still here. Can you sharpen your senses today? If not, I'm going to come back again tomorrow. If you don't want to do it tomorrow, guess what? I'll be back next week. I will not give up on you. And what can I do if finally for the first time, the one that I'm burning for returns the glow? I take this as twin flame energetic. Finally, when we're in that pillar of light and we've said no more dimming our shine, no more constricting our size to fit into a box so that we're accepted, so that we're liked, so that we're nice. No more of that. 
we send that out into the universal field, the Merkaba or the Merkaba, and it gets reflected back to us through our authenticity, through our sovereignty. The one that I'm burning for returns the glow. Well, let me tell you, when I had that twin flame experience up in the Paps of Anu with my friend Morris, holy moly, that sense of being so cherished, so safe, so seen, so heard, so loved, so nurtured, so comforted, so comforted. Wow. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And then we think if love has come at last, let's pick the worst time. We can think, excuse me, oh my gosh, I got to go to work. I got kids to take care of. I got all kinds of things to do. There's never a bad time for love. There's never a bad time for you and your love. Now listen to, to these last lyrics. Still, I know I've got to go. It's because we get that to that place on the spiral where we've grown and evolved and ascended enough. We know we cannot step back because to step back would be to agree to our woundology, Carolyn Mace's term. It would be agreeing to letting our wounds be what we lead with. And we're not doing that anymore, sisters. We are releasing the narrative of that constriction. Fly away, meadowlark, fly away in the silver morning. We are the meadowlark. We're flying now, sisters. If I stay, I'll grow to curse the dark, right? This is all about bringing the shadow up. The shadow doesn't come up to be resolved and deal dealed with dealt with if we keep repressing it that's when it rots and it turns ugly it putrefies but when we love our darkness when we love our shadow self that's when it comes up to be released resolved healed transformed alchemized so it's off where the days won't bind me we are not living under the prison of the to-do list anymore. The belief system that our productivity depicts our worth. I know I leave wounds behind me. Hell yes. Yeah, that's our mantra. I know we'll leave wounds behind us because we're transforming. We're no longer that, that being with that woundology. We've released that consciously, sovereignly. But I won't let tomorrow find me back this way. We're saying no more. I will not stay in the box. I will not keep clipping my own wings. I will not choose suffering over joy. I know that bliss, ecstasy, joy, and orgasmic living is my birthright. Fly away, fly away. And we won't wait to say goodbye. Mm -mm. No, we won't. We won't get mired back in the frequency, uh, the glue of our past self frequency. And I'm not saying past life. I'm saying the woundology narrative of our past self. No, that glue, we're impervious to it. And we won't wait to say goodbye, my beautiful young man. Remember, you are the adult woman and you're the young man, that twin flame energetic match. My beautiful young man and I. Oh. It is so exciting. Everything that Thomas brought up for me, every gift that this experience has given me, I'm just, I'm gonna keep flying. How are you gonna keep flying sisters? Let's talk about this. Let's not let this die on the vine and just listen. Let's keep flying. Let's fly together in formation. Let's let our natural inherent divine intelligence connect us knowing that we are one, that we are never alone, that we are always enough. And let's keep soaring, sisters. We can do this. It's in our blood. It's in our blood memory. I'm so grateful to you for listening. I'm so grateful. You may hear me if you're not watching this. By the way, this is going to be up on the YouTube channel. If you want to watch me doing this, you might find lots more things to giggle about. But my word, what are we going to do in relation to our magic? How are we going to keep embodying it? How are we going to keep staying in training for our own personal evolution and ascension? And how can self-love, self-acceptance, self-understanding, and self-compassion and self-forgiveness come in to sort of be the fuel for the rocket ship? for this ascension process. Okay. I love you. I am so grateful to you. 
we'll sing Meadowlark once again because I wanted the tune to get even more in your consciousness so you can hum it to yourself. Um, I just want to say too, please, please, please get in touch. If something I've said sparks something in your heart, get in touch. Let's keep this conversation going. There are lots of different ways that we can get together and communicate. We can work together. I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. My background is I'm a psychotherapist who's been studying many different modalities of spirituality and multidimensional consciousness and alchemization for many years. I lead groups. Um, I work with couples and individuals uh, just on all of these different things. So you can find me on my website, www.divine.com and mommy.com. You can purchase the Soul to Sisterhood book on the Soul to Sisterhood website, www.soul hyphen the word two to hyphen sisterhood.com. And you can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Pinterest, LinkedIn, just search Divine Mommy and Soul to Sisterhood. Let's stay in touch. Okay. Put your hands on your heart. I know this tune is familiar for you now. Thank Thomas for, I know I'm thanking Thomas, if it feels pertinent for you, thank Thomas for being here with us. Um, I'm so just thrilled that all of us are growing and there is such a collective convergence of open-hearted, grounded ascension. And I know those of us that are these way showers of this work, we are changing the very fabric of reality every day just by breathing. So even if you only ever sit on your couch and my, the ladies who have done my groups have heard me say this a gajillion times, even if you only ever sit on your couch in a pure vibration of self-love, you are healing the collective. You are healing your world, our world, my world, and others. Because throughout all time and space, we are connected. We are one. Namaste. All right. Who thinks they can do a little sing-along? Taking a drink of water. I think we can. I'll do a little send-off with Meadowlark. When I was a girl, I had a favorite story of a metal lark who lived where the rivers wind. Her voice can match the angels in its glory, but she was blind. The lark was blind, and old king came and took her to his palace, where the wall bronze and golden brain and he fed her fruit and nuts from an ivory chalice and he prayed sing for me my metal lark sing for me of the silver morning set me free the sea where the dolphins bark 
magic patiently waiting for your senses to grow sharper. <laughs> Namaste, everybody. I love you. Let's sing this song together. Like I said, get in touch. And who knows, maybe it won't take a year and a half to do podcast number five. <laughs> All right. Goodbye for now. Mwah.